Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Louis Diaz podcast. I'm really stoked to welcome back Hector Marcel after an amazing first episode that we did together. Welcome, Hector. Hi, Louis. So nice to see you and hi, everyone. Nice to see you too. And and just before I pressed record, you said, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but let's do it. <laughs> and the truth is, neither do I. So that makes two of us. But Why don't we talk about consciousness, reality and everything? I think... Well, yeah, let's start light with that and see where it goes from there. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good to me. What I was also reflecting on was our first episode together. And for anyone listening now, if you haven't listened to our first episode, it's episode 17, Equalizing the Human Experience with Hector Marcel. That was based on something that you said, that your work and Tibetan Buddhism is all about equalizing the human experience. I've been yeah. counting the days... <laughs> I'm so glad that we're back together. Me too. And I was listening to that episode a little bit this morning and uh, it it came back to me that we sort of started off with a bang. You were talking about it was an instruction from one of your teachers to look for the joy in everything. And um, you know what's really funny is that not only was that a really did that lead to something that was hilarious, which we'll touch on in a second, but that is the thing that I've been challenging myself with. And I'm not even studying Buddhism, you know, like for example, here at work, at the moment you know we might be out of business soon oh yeah 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 and i had to find a way of laughing about it (laughs) (laughs) but i had to find a way of laughing about it this morning and i I could which was great but yeah why don't you tell us what you've been up to the last 15 or so months since we spoke and then we'll, we'll kick off it's really been a whirlwind like three jewels the center the hub where i teach so uh, you know there's probably like three or four layers of students i've been at this 28 years and in that time i've been the student continued to be but then my job as i get older is I got to give this away to other people. It's helped me so much. It's transformed pain into pleasure. You know, like, yeah, you're losing, maybe you're losing your business. You know which businesses don't stop? None. They all do. It's just, what do you do when it happens and how do you become a better person? So in the last 15 months, I have like three layers of students that are really deep students that have been around for 12 years with me or something some that have been around for five years and and these are like really heavy duty philosophy in application people like they they, how do i learn from ancient texts but actually apply it to today to the garbage and the good that is happening in my life today and then we have the public you know we have all this programming for people that fortunately or unfortunately it's become a trend to be interested in wellness in meditation in preventative mental health and so at Three Jewels, a center where I train people. We've had, I don't know if what the numbers were when we spoke last time, we had like 60,000 visits last year and people are coming for all sorts of programming. You know, can I get better doing meditation? Can I get better doing somatic yoga? Can I get better doing service projects? You know, can I study? And so we've matured a lot in the last year and a half. We're doing retreats. Uh, My students are, you know, are already teachers in their own right, teaching in all sorts of places. So I, I don't know. I feel that I'm both enjoying the impact and we're reaching new heights. The challenges are, are getting better for us and I have more arms and legs to do the work. That's what it feels like for me. It's interesting, you know, I, I want to touch on that for a minute because I always think, you know, when you start these ventures, well, you know, Three Jewels and it started many years ago, I think it was Annie Palmer, was it? That's testing my memory. Yeah, yeah, good, good. And yeah. the nun who, who invited you it's in awesome. and it wasn't the dress up party that you thought it was going to be. <laughs> and here you are still. But then you, you start something yeah. and you might never sort of envision it at scale, right? So, <laughs> no, so never. Do, do these, I guess, uh, the challenge of scaling, you know, do you look at it as something that is possible or do you think it is at some point the scale sort of starts to potentially dilute the value or the quality of the work that you do? For yeah, example, yeah, it does. Use it does, a podcasting yeah. analogy. You know, if I want to punch out an episode every day, then I might have to cut back on the amount of editing that I do, and so the quality might not. Yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll compromise yeah. your yeah. quality. And yeah. so, that question hasn't come out of any experience that I've had, but more just out of interest. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like First and foremost, I never intended to be in charge of Three Jewels, let alone make it what it has become. But once it became my opportunity, my challenge, my task, once I realized I, I need to do something about sharing what I got from this place to others, 
two things occurred. You know, so I've spent a lifetime being an organizational change coach in Australia. That's where I started. And so I've seen many cultures in business trying to grow a venture, right? Like merge with another company, become a thing. And so I've seen growth in organizations. When humans get together and organize to do a thing, it's called an organization. And so we organize and we hope to scale and make money and whatever. So I've, I've had the privilege of working with large organizations uh, and help them develop a culture that is conducive, positive, uh, of service, brings value to customers and brings value to investors and the rest. But I've never matched the culture that I naturally experience at Three Jewels. It's a non-profit, so we're not about that money. Although we are doing well with the money and the more money that pours in, the more good we can do. So there is a money component, but it's not driven by it. Then there is a service component, and that's the core of it. Our job is to take care of people that need this preventative mental health measure. Sure, it comes from Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, but you can also say it comes from neuroscience. You can also say it comes from a yogic system. It's just human beings figuring out what do I do with this body-mind thing because I'm either in physical pain or in mental pain or both. And every now and then I flicker into some bliss, yeah? So it's been a fine line that I've been week to week, day to day, month to month, year to year, uh, managing to maintain service, like really serve people that come through those doors and read what they're looking for and make the offerings or do the bridge. It's our job at Three Jewels to make the bridge into what they need. I know what I know. I know the philosophy. I know the realizations. I know what they're supposed to do. I know what they have done. But... That's not enough just to sit at the door of a shop and go, hey, everybody, I got happy. My job is to go listen to what's making you unhappy and turn your pain into pleasure or give you the tools to turn your pain into pleasure yourself because I can't do it for you. And so that's what Three Jewels has become, this beautiful balancing act. And, you know, I started by saying there's all these students that are now teachers in their own right. And so now I have a multitude of teachers who are doing that same thing in sync so we're doing it together, and that's been really the success of Three Jewels. It's genuine. No culture that I've ever worked with matches it. People actually give a rats about a stranger that walks in and wants to take care of them because we are, like we started in the first episode, equalizing the human experience. We know for a fact that everybody that walks in, if you're a billionaire or if you're a homeless person, you've got some pain, you've got some pleasure, mental or physical. And our job is to find that common ground and give you the tools we have if you're interested and so it's been a big lesson for me you know because we learn in business that you have to make the profit and we have to do the customer service and it's not genuine to be honest we have to like build trust with our boss and our colleagues and as best as we do that or try to do that in organizations and provide service to the customer and develop mm. value you know it's bullshit most of the time Maybe we have in moments of a startup where that is genuine. But the bigger, the deeper the institution, the more distant that becomes. And so now I'm sort of addicted to the real way of humans relating, which is I genuinely give a rat. And yes, we do have to balance the money because the rent has to be paid and the electricity has to be paid. And because we're giving equal access to as many beings as we can, the money helps us provide these tools to people that would never ever have access to learn the fine workings of their mind through meditation or yoga or philosophy. And so oh, that's another thing that happened. You know, it, out of that 60,000 visits, about 40% of them were given access to these tools, teachings, retreats, classes, free or by donation, about 40% of them, which is amazing, you know, especially in New York where it costs so much to live. And of course, we've gone international. I don't know if that answered anything to you, Louis, but... Yeah, um, well, I, I think it did. I guess more specific to the question that I asked, I think you've been getting help from the people that have been growing on this journey with you is kind of something that I heard throughout all of that. People that were once students have become teachers and that, you know, it's not all on you to manage the challenge of the scale. No, on the contrary, actually, they've done a better job than I yeah. did when I had yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> to the community is growing and the responsibility is being shared. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And people are finding connections with not just me, but with other people. But we have the same flavor. That's yep. what's clear. Yeah, yeah. You know. Something else that we, we really need to touch on is your hair. Your hair is... Um, 
<laughs> Isn't it good? I can't stop looking at it. I actually missed half of your response because I was just staring at it just enviously. It What's just going on great, with that man? Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> Thank the you. Hell? No, Do you I'm know what it is? What, what have you done? It's a toupee. I glued on hair. No, no, it is. I tell you what happened. <laughs> You know, man, I know. <laughs> I'm like, it looks brilliant. I, I have a hairy hat. People wear yeah. things on their head all the time. Mine's <laughs> just got hair. <laughs> it just really suits you, man. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I did it as a, like, we have our yeah. Med Gala, our biggest fundraiser ask you about event. That. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the Med Gala was amazing. But you're supposed to dress up as what you imagine your future enlightened self would yeah. feel like. So people come dressed up to the hilt. And I tried like the first year of the Met Gala, the second year of the Met Gala to go wild. Like I think I would be wild. And they, because we had press, we had national TV interviews. I really couldn't. I had a dress. I had an old 1800s morning dress with a whole veil and so on covering the beard. And, but I couldn't talk to the news channels looking so weird. So I had to wear a last minute. We're like, we can't do that, Hector. So we, I had to wear the tuxedo and the, you know, it's black tie. I had sure, to be sure. the boss. Yeah. And I was a little disappointed that I didn't get to, to be cool. Like everyone else was dressed really amazing. And they're like their enlightened self. And I have to be like the guy talking to yeah. the camera, you know. So um, this year I thought I'm going to surprise everyone and just have hair. So I went and looked up. I looked up what does it take to put a <laughs> toupee. <laughs> And I didn't tell anyone. I just showed up to the Med Gala with it. Not even my closest friends. No idea. Right? And everyone's like, did you cut your beard? You look radiant. What is it? Like, nobody could tell. <laughs> and I just thought, I, I'll keep it. The response was so good. And I was, uh, I really was invited to step into a kind of joy. People that would never talk to me on the subway are talking to me. So to me, it's hilarious because A, I have so much bad judgment to two pace. Like I really have, like, you know, I, I was living in the ball thing. So I've got all these really shitty states of mind and I have to look at my face every morning and like, oh, that's right, I got hair. <laughs> and I tell you, it's a new window to practice. So first of all, it, I have to get through my personal rejection. And then secondly, it looks good. Like when I settle with it, it looks good. People give me good feedback. So it, it's a it's a practice to wear the hair. <laughs> I love how everything comes back to your Buddhist practice. If it doesn't do that, then I you know then it's then I wouldn't. If it was vanity alone, like I'm not saying I'm not being vain about it. I'm enjoying Amazing. looking better than I felt before. But it, that's not the game, you know. Like you can look great and then be rotten inside. But it really has shown me how judgmental yeah. I am yeah. to people that have wigs. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. So I, mean, to be I guess that there'd be a part of you that's enjoying those people on the subway talking to you like more, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, there's a difference. I was sort of getting more and more invisible the yeah. older I was getting and the beard and the whole thing. And suddenly I'm not invisible. And it, that's another insight, you know. And there's yeah, more. gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> And the Met Gala, yeah. yeah. So since we first spoke, there's been two Met Galas. We we spoke before your 2023 Met Gala, and then obviously you had that, and then you've had the 2024 Met Gala as well. And now we're sort of we did a pre Met Gala conversation, and now we're doing a post Met Gala, two post Met Gala conversations. And I want to know, like, what's that been like? Is it has there been growth in that? Yeah, we're definitely getting. It was an experiment, like you know that New York has the Met yeah. Gala yeah. annually, right? I didn't know so about that by the way, like because I don't sort of lurk in the fashion tabloids you know so yeah it's huge right we take over the men well celebrities uh, anna winter vogue and all the fashionistas and all the celebrities from hollywood everywhere in the world they want to get invited to the to yeah. the met gala look amazing on the red carpet and look crazy and then no one's allowed any photographs and it's a big fundraiser for the fashion department of the met yeah metropolitan mm. museum of art um I think we could raise money f for improving minds and not just keeping old yeah. clothes in a shop. You know, as, as cool as the museum is, as, as awesome as all the celebrities are. So I loved the 
paradigm to say, uh, well, if we're going to spend all this time and money with fashion, celebrities, PR and marketing, it's not even about the fashion anymore, you know, and all that money. Like, you, I think it's something like thirty to fifty thousand dollars to be invited mm. that you have to contribute. And I'm like, what three jewels a nonprofit can do to the number of minds who are struggling to find inner peace or wisdom or understand how to deal with stressors, that what a world we would have if a portion of what is raised in the Met Gala could happen through the Met Gala. And so we have been able to not just fundraise for that purpose, but invite other wellness communities in New York and abroad to come and join in sort of in harmony to say we're not competing for people's attention to teach them yoga meditation if we're really honest about what we're teaching people in all these yoga studios all this sound baths and all if we're really honest we should be working for the benefit of the minds that want to get deeply happy and understand their psyche in a mm. way that is sustainable and so for that one night let's all be perfect friends because the students are going to go to this studio and that studio and this thing and that thing and they're going to test it out but if we're together as an industry and say we're here for the betterment of all your minds a it's began to do that more and more more and more wellness brands are coming on board and supporting the Medit Gala. We've been able to siphon good amounts of funds to people and we've extended the access to not just meditation classes or in-studio classes, membership scholarships. We've extended to bringing people on retreat, people that would never go on retreat, spend a week in silence, be trained on how to train, treat their minds in silence and focus on a particular thing and have a transformative experience. And we just got back from one of those retreats. I'll give you an example. This one lady with slight autism would never have come. So she got a scholarship. She said after the retreat was finished, she shared with everybody in the retreat that it's for the first time in her life, and she's my age, that she felt seen because everyone was quiet. Everyone was in silence and she could just be her weird self, right? She could just be herself and nobody was talking or questioning or anything, and she didn't either. She started crying by expressing the gratitude and the love that people showed her in walking past and hugs and the rest, and the profound experience she had that was transformative in her mind got quiet. She hadn't had that in a long time. She says, and I haven't cried for years. Like, I don't remember what it was like to cry. So when I saw that experience happen, and then the change, not just in her, but in the 30 participants, that where they're going, damn, I had a profound experience with that. We are the same. All of us humans deserve the right to find that space within our minds and feel access to a part of us that we forgot. So thanks to the Met Gala, we've been able to bring people into deeper experiences, not just come to a yoga class, come to a meditation class, do a training, but actually have a deep transformative retreat experience. So that's been an amazing thing. The other thing we've been really good at is uh, the team knows how to put a good party together. It's just a massive party. So they know now how to get the right DJ, the right lighting, the right music, the right brands that support. You know, it's a sober party, so smart water supported. And like, there's a bunch of really big brands that are going, yeah, yeah, let us support you guys. That's so amazing. cool. I mean, you yeah, your team's picking up these event management skills as well. And you're learning how to run a world-class sober event you know that's for a good cause it's brilliant i know it's fun too like it was yeah. people get to have fun there's maybe a couple of people maybe a team of 10 who are hyper stressed trying to bring sure. <laughs> trying to bring peace of mind to everyone yeah. else <laughs> uh, but i'm not one of those that's the team you know, um, we had a project. I don't know if you caught wind of this on the in, on the internet. We thought of it last minute, just before this Met Gala, and it was called. Let me look it up. We kept having people from international yeah. places saying, "We can't come to yeah. New York for your Met Gala. How can we contribute? How can we donate? How can we have a taste of the experience?" And so we came up this last minute. It's called Blended Voices of Future Angels. Blended Voices of Future Angels. And what it was is for a sh donation of your choice, a dollar, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, you would press the donate button and you would type up a message from your future enlightened self 
from anywhere in the world, you imagine you've reached your goal of complete and utter happiness, you've transformed every pain into pleasure, and you send yourself a message saying, hey, remember this, because when you get to me, it'll be like this, right? And so that was the prompt, just send from your future self, send your current self an enlightened message. So you get mm. enlightened faster. And it just went wild. People from all over the world started sending messages and donating, sending messages and donating. Then we had this professional sound people that are volunteers at Three Jewels blend all those messages together. All these volunteers at Three Jewels recorded the messages live two days before the event. They put some ambient music on it and the track went on for, I don't know, half an hour or something. And there were these headsets that you could put on in the middle of this massive Med Gala party. The music was going off. You couldn't hear it through your headphones. You could just see people dancing, the lights going on. And you just kept getting a download of message after message full of love and full of kindness and full of hope. You know, this beautiful, I don't know, it was a, you were sitting in, in this bench overlooking the entire Med Gala. It was lovely. It was so Is lovely. That available, that recording available somewhere for people to plug into? Because I imagine there'd be so much value in just having that there, just permanently for people to plug yeah, into. That was part of the thing. If you sent a message and made a donation, we would send you the recording. Uh, and <laughs> wait till next year. But but I can <laughs> The freemium model doesn't exist check. there, does it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me check. I'll send you. I would love to hear I'm it. Sure the, you know, there's gonna be a link. Yeah, and I'm yeah, sure the yeah. audience would, you know, yeah. there, there's going to be people that follow you that would be like, oh, well, I can't go back in time and donate. And I, I don't want to wait till next year to be one of those angels. The link is still there for next year. But maybe I can get them to say anyone that does that. So it's on my Instagram and it's called Send a Divine Message. Still, it's on my link tree. But I'll take it as an action point. I'll try and get you a copy. I also got to let the team do what they decided. So if they made a promise yeah, to everyone absolutely. else. Absolutely. We don't want to break any promises. Yeah. No, no, no. But I, I'd love for you to hear it. For sure. Yeah, that's so interesting. It, it sounds like there's been pretty much for the last 20 minutes, we've been talking about the last 15 months or so since we originally spoke and the scale and the, you know, the benefit of the scale. Not only ha have you been growing and you, you've got this great team around you that's been able to sort of help you with the responsibility of that growth, but it sounds like there's new initiatives popping up as well. It sounds like you're reaching new people. It sounds like with those, the way that you're able to reach people has changed as well, not just giving them access to the tools, but also inviting them to retreats. So you know what? It's quite a juxtaposition, you know, sitting here in a corporate landscape myself, seeing all the doom and gloom that's been happening in business globally, you know, with people being let go from their jobs. And here I am talking to a, the principal or the, or the CEO or what, whatever you call yourself of global enlightenment. El Presidente. El Presidente, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, El Presidente. Uh, I won't do it again, I promise. Um, <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, here I am talking to El Presidente of Global Enlightenment <laughs> Studio 3 Jewel, and it just seems like there's nothing but good news. There's nothing but growth. No, no, we, we have problems. Yeah. But my job is to turn pain into pleasure. Sure. And it's a practice. It's not bypassing. It's like acknowledge what's wrong. We have plenty of things that are wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, and plenty of people... Like the reason we are a tight community, there's pain, but we work it and we don't let it win. Kind of ruined my narrative there for a second, but it's fine. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> No, but I think that that is, you know, one of the things that I've really been thinking about a lot over the last several months or whatever it is, is, is admitting when things aren't going right, being able to open up about when things aren't going right. Of course, it's great to pat ourselves on the back. And for me, it's really great to hear that there's been so much good happening. But I'm glad you stopped me there and said, nah, hang on, it's not all roses here. Because a lesser person would have sat there and... Um, you know, blushed and, and felt really good about themselves and the, the work that they've done with their team. But you just sort of wanted, you you felt compelled to interrupt me and go, whoa, 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 it's not all roses here at Three Jewels. Yeah, yeah, no. We, it's the way we handle it. That, so, uh, yeah, that's that's why it's called practice, number one, yeah. <laughs> because we can't, we can't just learn it and then do it. It's like, so I don't know if I told you this last time, you know, I've been studying Buddhism 28 years. There's a list. Did I tell you about the list of mental afflictions? Rings a 
Bell vaguely, but I'm not sure it's whether you told me or something I've seen. The list starts off with one core mental affliction, meaning one state of mind that causes all the screw-ups for us, turns into two, yeah, which now means there's three core mental afflictions, states of mind that cause suffering, then it turns into ten, and then those ten turn into this, and then they begin to define and slice the states of mind that cause us pain. The biggest number is 84,000 mental afflictions that you can either remove one by one, anger, jealousy, envy, things that cause us pain, yeah, mm. that will cause us to suffer. Mm. Right, so if I if I watch you having something that I would like to have, like natural hair, and then <laughs> which I'm losing by the way, I can show you. Yeah, well, don't worry. There's an answer. It looks good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I even got a toupee that shows that I might be losing it to keep it real. Uh, yeah, you have. Um, it's, it's thought it's... of everything. <laughs> anyway, it's my furry. You're hat. gonna be my toupee um, consultant. <laughs> That's my. I have become a toupee consultant. It's been the, <laughs> the result of 28 years of Buddhism. <laughs> yeah. So basically it's saying there's so many states of mind that will cause us suffering. Because if I see something that you have that I would like to have, why do I wish I had it, which implies I wish you didn't, which is what jealousy is, yeah. right? If it is something I really want and I see someone else having it, why do I not just have happiness that someone has it, at least someone has it? Yeah. Why, why is that not my automatic response? So this, the human condition will have us be in states of suffering mm -hmm. because we have a bad response about reality, a habituated shitty response, which must necessarily produce a negative experience. That's what suffering comes mm. from, these states of mind, right? So we are still practitioners at Three Jewels. Well, everyone that, that has come, they've realized they have a mental affliction, some yeah. problem in consciousness, in their lived experience, something's hurting. Mm -hmm. So they come to the rituals, they want to study, they want to meditate, they want to find out, they want it to get better. The first thing we have to get rid of is the misunderstanding that me sitting down in a meditation posture with my eyes closed is going to fix everything in one sit. That's stupid, it's never worked, you don't have to look like the Instagram thing, you have to get to the state of mind. And that takes practice. So coming to Three Jewels or any other studio or meditating once or twice or three times isn't going to cut it. Mm. It will just begin a new habit of instead of responding to pain with more pain, you could respond to it with wisdom. The wisdom that understands you're habituating your state of mind to become something that must give you bliss instead of giving you pain. Because if something has a cause, if, if everything has a cause, which everything that changes has a cause, so my mind changes, it has pain, it has pleasure, it has pain, it has pleasure. If the pain has got a cause, if I find the cause of that and remove it, the result will never come, right? So that's what practice is. Stop planting the causes for your pain by being jealous that someone's got something you like. Be happy someone has something you like, because they must like it too, you idiot. Then you're not creating suffering, right? So, oh, okay, and that takes practice. The reason I'm saying all this is because you could look at Three Jewels as a concentrated place where people are happy because they continue to practice despite themselves, despite the impulse, despite the suffering that brought them there in the first place. The people that stay at Three Jewels, the students that I've got for 10 years, 12 years and so on, they're getting good at the practice. The ones that come in for the Med Gala and go away, they think at the beginning, like we all do, that I'm gonna go have an event, go take a, s a meditation sit, go do a yoga class, and then I should be changed forever. That's not the case, that's never the case, that will never be the case. Our minds are habituated, addicted to a certain state of being, and unless you remove the root cause of that addiction, it will just keep coming back. That's why practice is called practice. Yeah. I, I wanted to clarify because you could also say Three Jewels is full of people that are full of mental afflictions, and that's why they keep hanging out there. <laughs> Yeah, and you've got them locked in forever. Yeah, well, they got themselves locked in forever. You know, like we're, we're a volunteer-based organization. Everyone's allowed to come and go as they please, but they choose to yeah. stay because they found, they saw with their mind the possibility that it can be, the pain can go. They've seen it either logically first, they felt it intuitively in the community or in other people. They saw the genuineness, right? Because you know when you're being sold something and you know when you're actually tapped into a real experience. And that's the big difference. 
there's this authenticity and rawness at Three Jewels. Like I'm trying to share with you, there is garbage. Like, of course, people are jealous of each other at Three Jewels, you know, like, but then they know what to do about that jealousy. They don't feel guilty about it. They're like, oh, I've got something to work on. I thought I was done with that. And so then, you know, in a formal practice, every two weeks you gather with other people who are practicing and you have this purification ceremony. And the purification ceremony is to purify every instant that your mind had caused more <coughs> negativity. You're there to purify it. How do you do that? You confess the shitty thoughts you had about other people. And so we get together every two weeks and go, listen, I was jealous that you had hair. I wish I hadn't thought of that. I'm happy you got hair. I'll change my, I'll, my practice and go deeper that oh, way. Oh, man. That's like a taxi it's cab confessions, that. that old show from the 90s where they have a, like... A, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'd get some serious dirt in those um, meetings, but yeah. wow. Those confessionals... It's just like the Catholic, right? You go into a Catholic church and go to the confessional. Oh, and you sit there and say they're stuff. private. They're not like in a group setting. No, no, they're in a group setting. Yeah, yeah, together. But but it's the same idea. If you fess up, yeah, then it has less power. Yeah. But the cool thing about the Buddhists, they don't just have the confessional. So at the ceremony, we also have the rejoicical. You sit there and you go, but my mind did this awesome thing in the last two weeks. And then the, there's the whole rejoice practice. Oh, there's so many things that you touched on there that just reminds me of little bits and pieces that I've, you know, collected along the journey of life. And the first one was like in the power of the community. I suppose while you were talking about everything just then, all I was thinking about is like, yeah, okay, I could try and do this on my own, but I feel like it's in the, the power of, of doing it next to someone or someone's or a whole group of people whether it's in person or or globally i feel like there'd be a lot of fortification in the practice associated with doing it with others you know yeah we keep each other accountable it's like the analogy my teacher taught about meditating together or practicing together is like many pencils you can't break them together but if it's just one pencil easy to break two maybe easy yeah. you've got 10 50 pencils together you can't break them so there is strength you said fortification but there's strength in in practicing together that's a really great analogy. It makes it a lot more, I guess, tangible in my imagination for sure. I'm trying to, I'm trying to imagine myself snapping fifty pencils. It's bloody hard, bloody hard. Yeah, yeah. You can't do it after four or something. Yeah. yeah. Kind of something else you were talking about when you were talking about, you know, like I'm jealous that this person has this nice thing that I've got, and the mindset shift can be, duh. Why can't I be stoked for that person because they like something that I like? Brilliant. Yeah. And if they have it, wouldn't that make them happy? Wow. A yeah. happy person on the planet. How awesome. So good. I reflect on that thinking. Well. It isn't that sort of the development of like an abundance and gratitude mindset in a way? Yeah. Is that and, and what it does is it amplifies because now you're generating genuine gratitude. Like, wow, this is awesome. At least there's one happy person. Then basically you're imprinting your mind with that bias. And just like the addiction to negativity, the mind just repeats. And then you begin to have an experience of always positivity. That's why gratitude works. Yeah, gratitude really does work. And um, yeah, we don't apply it enough. Well, it is true that the human condition has a negativity bias and you can explain it a thousand ways. The saber, cyber tooth tiger, I used to call it Spanish, English second language, saber tooth tiger. Saber tooth, tooth. yeah, yeah. Because we are hyper focused on fear, what's going to hurt us, what's going to destroy us, we have the tendency to pay way more attention to negativity. And since there's no physical threat, now it's just possible negativity, negative thoughts. So we maintain that machinery alive by having a bias to pay way more attention to negativity, which creates the addiction of a negative bias, which means we are then more likely to notice and live in the negative than the positive. The gratitude balances that out, but you have to work three, four, five times harder to create the habit that overruns the negativity bias, because it's like positivity. You can try it once, twice. I can say 10 nice things to you and one shitty thing, and that one shitty thing will be the thing you remember right? And the other 10 would have been real. So positivity is like Teflon for us, like a nonstick pan, but negativity is like Velcro. You know, it just, as soon as it touches, it sticks on. And that's just the human condition. That's why it's called practice again. You've got to habituate it. I love that. 
I was just talking to Hamima. She's someone that's been on the podcast now three times. And Hamima is a shamanic practitioner, takes people through plant medicine journeys and has a lot of amazing theories about the earth and uh, the meaning of our existence here or the purpose of our existence here. And there's so many different schools, you know, of teachings and thoughts that come from different disciplines, I suppose you would call it, or origins maybe. But I, I love that you touched on earlier that we're all one collective because something that I've become really obsessed with, and maybe you, you might have some insight into this, is the correlations between you know something that Hector says and something that Hamima says. And something that, as I was saying in, in the episode that I did with Hamima, a kid from Brighton says, you know, when you know, I had these these guys here, like loose little Aussie units on the podcast a few episodes ago. Um, I called it, this is not a safe space because we just roast each other and it was just fun as hell. (laughs) And, you know, it's great to have um, intellectual, spiritual, soulful discussions with people like yourself. But, you know, the joy of podcasting for me is about authenticity and not only talking to people with, you know, high sort of frequency mindsets but what are what are a couple of kids from brighton that like sinking tinnies since you mentioned it before <laughs> the tinnies <laughs> and, and graffitiing and dropping f-bombs and c-bombs every second word what are they like what are they into and um it sort of clicked i was chatting to one of these guys and his name's rigby right little funny as how little aussie kid got a heart of gold this kid i swear and he'd been drinking quite a bit before we got the mics out we're all in the countryside and this guy's talking about the first time he went fishing and it's one of the funniest stories you'll ever hear but at the end of it he goes yeah you know it's really good because we go to like at the end of the pier at brighton and i just get to watch the sunset and it's just amazing and i was like gratitude 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 And so if I bring that to, you know, conversation that I have with you and conversation that I have with Helmima, it seems like everyone, like this kind of light bulb moment that seems to occur for everyone that I'd speak to is like, I bring it back to gratitude. Like I could be talking to someone from, you know, Denmark about travel photography and they're always talking about gratitude in their own way and for me it's been one of the most enlightening things about this podcast has been like oh wow we are all the same we really are like at the end of the day uh, you could divide that into not just humans but all living things move towards pleasure or goodness or happiness whatever you want to call that side that's attractive that can help me, that feels good, it's beautiful. And we avoid, even amoeba, avoid anything that's harmful, we want to reject and the rest. And so in that sense, you could say every single living being in the world moves towards happiness and avoids suffering, all of us. The difference is our understanding on the strategies that will get us there. So if I want to get happy, punching you in the face might give me temporary happiness, but it will cause more suffering for me because I've witnessed myself create suffering. And now I have a recording, if you will, in my consciousness, which must turn into something because everything that is created must have a result. Yeah, every cause must have a result. So this, that doesn't disappear just because I had an experience. It gets imprinted in our minds and then we have to live the consequences of everything, you know? And so there's strategies to maintain happiness and there's strategies to avoid suffering and they work if we live by the code that creates that happiness really and avoids that happy, that in unhappiness really. And, and then gratitude is one of the things, one of the practices that is all encompassing because it necessarily changes the bias where everything is negative, everything's uh, gonna hurt us and the rest. You know, there are bad things coming to all of us, right? They, in, in Buddhism, they, they call these the four fierce river currents that every being has to go through. The suffering of birth, they call it, is the first one. Because as soon as you're born, you're marked to end. So then the suffering of death is also certain. Then in between that, you have old age and illness. If you're lucky, you're going to get old, right? And if you're lucky, you're going to get several illnesses, not just one. But all those four things come to every living thing here. And so they are called a suffering because they separate you from what you want, right? They they hurt to say goodbye to people you love. It hurts to be sick. And, but if you understand how to transform even that, uh, then you're set, you know? And, and so... 
it is right to have compassion and gratitude and in the short period of time that we are together you know and it's right to have gratitude towards other people like i'm happy people have what they want even if i don't that will change me you know yeah well, i'm going to walk out onto burke street and the next porsche driver i see i'm going to walk right up to the window and go you lucky bastard you yeah exactly exactly no but i i get to teach people that are buddhist for a long time and they sort of they get really heady about the practice and i'm like just forget the practice you're a lucky bastard like that's exactly the words i say they don't know that like in australia that makes sense in america they think i'm swearing at them i'm like no they do, they do. i'm like no you lucky bastards like you're sitting here contemplating whether or not you can get happy you lucky bastard who has that luxury you know how many people are working their asses off building things that you get to consume in your house through amazon how many People are collecting the rice that you're going to eat tonight. You know what their lives are like? You lucky bastard. You're sitting here contemplating whether you're going to be happy. Do it properly. <laughs> Stop being depressed. <laughs> yeah, it's so true, isn't it? It's like getting out, get out of your own bubble for a moment. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge collectively in the world is the bubbles that we create around, you know, our own circumstances. And they're all figments of our imagination. You know? Yes. It's like, oh, woe is me. And like, you could walk within a hundred meters in certain cities and see something whoa hang on i'm glad i'm not that guy you yeah know, it's you know i heard a statistic last week do you know what qualifies you financially to be at the top one percentile of the wealthiest people in the world do you know this statistic no no idea don't tell me i'll be depressed and you'll have to counsel me the rest of this episode to be in the one percentile of the entire world population financially you have to earn thirty five thousand dollars a year thirty five thousand dollars us so for you guys it's 75 no so <laughs> no no sorry i don't I was know gonna say. <laughs> Might be 45 or something, you at Australia? Snuck into the 1%. But you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. 1%. Everyone else, 99% yeah. of the people on this planet, our neighbors included, are living underneath that. Out of all the people, all mm -hmm. the people in India, all the people in Asia, all the people in Europe, all the people in Africa, all the people in South America, 99% of them are living below 35K a year. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting statistic because on its own, you know, it doesn't, with the knowledge and understanding that I have from the things that I hear other people say, it doesn't have a lot of legs, right? Because we can now dispel, you know, that fallacy, I think, of that, you know, money makes us happy. We, we, yeah, we yeah. go to people, yeah, like you have, and you, sir, have been on several vacations or retreats. Uh, over the last 12 months it seems like every time i tuned into your story you were wearing like a hawaiian shirt and there was a party yeah, or true. like an exotic street somewhere oh, that's thinking, true gosh yeah I like to, i'd love to live like hector for a day um yeah, yeah. lucky bastard and um <laughs> <laughs> and um you know like you, you just hear people say all the time oh people in that country are so happy they're so poor but they're so happy yeah, yeah. You know? i've experienced that yeah. many times so we've got this and and Hamima calls it a, the matrix you know but we've built this um systems in the west that dangle this carrot that we can never reach you know because it's it's hanging off a stick that's attached yeah. to us right and it's and it's yeah. just slightly further than an arm's length away so the more we run to it we think we're getting closer but it, because the stick is attached to us we're never going to reach that carrot and that's that's the financial system that's that's the money right and so it's an interesting challenge for people in the west to realize that they're simultaneously whilst being in that top one percent as you put it we're probably the most miserable people on the planet yeah i wonder if they measured happiness where it would be found you know what kind of humans well i'm reading this book at the moment it's called ikigai the japanese secret to a long and a happy life and that question, sir, has been answered. Let's hear it. Let me read the blurb to you. Is that Yeah, yeah, yeah. Discover the Japanese secret to a long and happy life with the internationally best selling guide to Ikigai. Ikigai is basically the term for what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, and what you're good at. It's like a Venn diagram of of those. Got it, got it, got it, got it. The people of Japan believe that everyone has an ikigai, a reason to jump out of bed in the morning. 
inspiring and comforting, this book will give you the life-changing tools to uncover your personal ikigai. It will show you how to leave urgency behind, find your purpose, nurture friendships, and throw yourself into your passions. Bring meaning and joy to every day with ikigai. Beautiful. Oh, that's awesome. It's lovely. Have you read much through it? Yeah, I'm halfway through it. And the thing about it is, is, is that they focus on the Okinawans which is are these people of Japan that live on this little island of Okinawa and somehow they just seem to be easily living past a century. It's got wow. the highest cool. rate of centurions um, in the world. And not only are they living past a hundred, and, and these people are breaking down and doing the worm, you know, on the D floor. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not quite, but the look of joy and satisfaction on these people's faces is just something to behold. And they attribute their longevity and their happiness to so many things, but none of them has been money so far. Yeah. And they do oh, talk oh. about finances and they talk about uh, this special little ritual that some of the Okinawans have where essentially you're in a community group, like uh, let's just call it a little circle of buddies. You know, like those old Italian guys that sort of, you know, <laughs> yes, all the Greek guys complaining about their wives and stuff. And, <laughs> uh, uh, um, you're in a community like that and basically. That what they do is they have this this kitty in the community and everyone puts in a little bit and every three months or something someone else gets like the excess from that kitty and as a community they sort of just keep each other supported keep each other going they appreciate that money isn't the important thing but having each other's backs is so oh, to speak. so good so yeah i mean it's so uh, i'm sure dozens of your students would have read this book because it's um it's been out for a few years now um, but it was, like it says, an international bestseller and I only just got it recently. But yeah, like money is, yeah, there's a lot of miserable assholes with money. Let's look. look we, know, <laughs> we know. You and I know. Oh, I've met many. I've met many, yeah. many, many. Yeah. So yeah, I find that really interesting. I mean, that, that statistic, it's a statistic of an old paradigm. Yeah, Like absolutely. if you're still yeah, thinking right. like that, then, you know, like something's not up and, and look it's easy for me to say because technically i qualify as being in the top one yeah yeah right yeah, so do i yeah. but at the same time <laughs> i can tell you like there's always more <laughs> like it's always well, someone making more money than me yeah exactly and, fr and from a eastern psychology point of view they say there's three types of suffering that we have to overcome one is the physical suffering, like the suffering of suffering, like just regular everyday suffering. The other one is the suffering of change, yep. that we get disorientated when things change and we get upset and we don't know what to do. And even if those two get fixed, we have, they call it all pervasive suffering. And it means that I am never satisfied suffering. So even if you got everything you wanted right now, mm. within a short time, could be minutes, it could be an hour, it could be two, you want it better, you want more. You want it deeper. Mm. You want something else. Yeah. And that is hard to satisfy unless you get to the very root of the thing that assumes if I get this, then I'll be happy. If I get like we do it in relationships, right? To expect another person to make me happy is that flavor, right? You've got to behave a certain way before I get happy. First of all, it's completely unfair on you. And it guarantees suffering because at some point you're going to you're, you're going to let me down. You know, I'm going to I'm going to have to be disappointed at some point. So it's a guarantee for suffering to expect anyone or anything to bring me happiness. Everyone is responsible for their own transformation of those of these minds of ours. And then whatever's happening outside, we can turn pain into pleasure. We can transform our experience of the world into something blissful. You can find a silver lining in everything if you look. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's a, it's such a good reminder and especially timely for me because I'm going through that at the moment, just defaulting into like the worst version of my own thoughts of, of you know, my own emotions and feelings. And I'm like, oh, fuck, here I am again, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. But don't add trouble to the trouble, you see, because you have the power. We all have the capacity to find a wisdom and learn that the worst thing that can happen is I'll learn something. At least I'll learn something. So as unfair as it is to expect it, we all do it naturally. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry that you're going through it. We'll all go through it. But there is a rainbow at the other side of the silver lining. Yeah. For me, it's really 
it, it's actually something that I developed accidentally, the ability to stop and laugh in shitty moments. My first experience of it was when I was like 19 or something like that. And I was, yeah, broke. And I was brushing my teeth and just thinking about how I was about to pick up a paycheck. And with this paycheck, I was not going to be able to afford my rent and my food and everything. And it was pretty miserable one minute of staring at myself in the mirror while I'm sort of doing the whole, you know, teeth brushy thing, you know, it's like with this reality. And then I, I drove my car to the, the bar that I was working in. And as I was walking up the stairs to go to the office to get my pay, I just sort of clicked into like, you know what? fuck this, I am not going to let life like ruin my state of mind. I can find joy in this moment. And I just sort of started laughing. And turns out when I picked up my pay, literally 30 seconds later after walking up the stairs and, and with that mindset, somehow there was double the amount that should have been there in the envelope. That's amazing. I know. And I'm like, well, you know, if I didn't have that thought, would would that have yeah, been yeah. there? You know, yeah. like, you know, the the... It's not cause and effect of, of like the quantum field or maybe if you want to call it that. But then also a couple of months later, the manager that was responsible for everyone's pay has got caught for, for embezzlement and she got taken out by the cops. And, and I think, did she, like, I, knew she, I know she was stealing money for herself because, you know, she was busted for that. But did she kind of like in a moment of like kindness, she knew my situation. Did she wow. kind of just like embezzle a bit extra for the for old louis here <laughs> you know like did she do that for me oh what a sweetheart um, how affirming yeah yeah so ever since then you know I've, I've you know and look let's just say that i'm no master at this by any means but at times i've been able to develop this ability to just laugh out loud at shit shitty situations yes, to the point where I, I know i've been looked at in the street going what the fuck is this <laughs> laughing at but yeah it's so interesting you know one of the things that we haven't talked about is um ugly babies oh and that's been a long time coming <laughs> yeah i know i know and i have an update on the ugly baby situation by the way let's hear it ugly baby got an ugly sibling no 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 let's yeah. i haven't met them have i you certainly haven't but you know last time you and i spoke you were using the analogy of the ugly baby that people bring into the studio and that analogy for the ugly baby is for, you know, our trauma and our hurts and our pains. Our depression, uh, our yeah. anxiety. Look at, and, they, and we wear it like a proud medal. Like we just gave birth to this thing. We own it. Look at everyone. Yeah. Please acknowledge it. Yeah. Isn't yeah, it? Isn't exactly. it lovely? My deep pain. Don't take it away from me, but, but I wish it wasn't here. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. It's such a good analogy for all of those reasons. And then I started like spontaneously combusting in laughter because I knew someone that had just had a baby and was posting them all over social media and the, the baby wasn't an attractive <laughs> baby. It was like the opposite of, of an attractive baby. Oh my goodness. And I couldn't help but think of that baby while you were trying to seriously tell me about this analogy that you use. And um, it led to a uh, one of the most memorable moments that I've had with anyone on this podcast is just you and I laughing about the same thing, but different things in a, yeah, for the same reason. It's kind of cool. Um, anyway, in the last 12 months, there's been a sibling added to the family. <laughs> Wait, are they good looking? They're better looking than... than <laughs> But the second child always is. And I'm saying that because, you know. Because brother... you're the second child? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But I think the third one oh. has to have best hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me guess. You're the third one. You're oh, the third yeah. One. The third. Yeah. Okay. Well, you do. <laughs> Thank you very much. I yeah. purchased it myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, brilliant. And, and yeah, I think, um, look, I touched on all these retreats that you've been on. I'm curious to know what you've got in store for the next 12 months. You know, there's a lot happening in the world at the moment. You know, there's a lot of, you know, turmoil. And one of the things that, you know, Hamima said in my conversation with her is that that sort of thing about the night is darkest before the dawn, so to speak. And when darkness in the world is being revealed, 
that it's because light is being shone on it and that's ultimately a good thing and i love those ways of looking at it and i'm wondering you know if these are concerns within your community and you know if they come up your way of looking at them yeah my uh, thanks for asking that because there is so much pain in all sorts of shapes and colors around the world right now and thank goodness we have mass communication and what a horrible thing that we have mass communication you know like yeah, one thing sure. i remember when I was growing up in Australia, we had three TV channels, four after a little while. The news in the 80s and 90s, the, the news, mostly the 80s, the, the news was whatever the headline is, AIDS epidemic, that lasted three years on the news. You know, the Gulf War, that lasted however long the war did and then all the commentary after. Every now and then some catastrophe would happen somewhere in the world and we'd be addicted to getting updates and the rest mm. on the two, three, four TV channels. Then we would pick up the landline and call each other and say, listen, this happened and we'll talk about it. And this generation, the generation me included, right, we're addicted to getting one terrible news every few minutes. Yeah. So I don't think the world has changed very much. I think that we are more aware of all the things that are happening, are capable of communicating, and partly because we're addicted to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. We're never satisfied with the news we got or the closure we had about that thing. We need the next trauma and the next ugly baby, and so we're just mm. constantly popping out babies because we're addicted to having to feel and point at something that isn't working or this. So human suffering has been happening on this planet ever since there were humans. And the human condition will continue to produce that suffering and all the consequences of that suffering. We've had wars ever since we were born. You know, we've had the same number. Of, in fact, there's a statistic that says we have more happy people in the world now than we've ever had. <laughs> we've had more access to things in, now in the world than we've ever had. Sure. That, I believe that. You know, it, we've had less war than we've ever had, etc., etc. So there's, there are statistics that say that, but that won't change the individual suffering of the people observing the human condition. And our minds, like Velcro, will stick to the suffering, will pay attention to it, we're addicted to it, yeah? So the way that I help people that come to Three Jewels, that their minds are telling them to take a side for the conflict that's currently before them, and they take a side in the hope that if that thing happened, like if we could bomb all of those people that are bombing us, then I'll be happy forever. It's bullshit. It's not true. It's a lie. It'll just cause more friction. On top of it, you've harmed in your mind a whole bunch of people because they're of a gender or because they're of a nationality or for whatever reason, good or bad reason, it doesn't matter. Mm. To wish another life gone is not a good thing. So there's always a middle way. And I invite people to consider the middle way between harm for harm or complete passivity and let it hurt you that's not the answer either so the only domain we have control over the only territory you can do anything about is your territory your own mind your own body make peace with those around you and watch your world turn more peaceful make peace with the ugly neighbor with the angry boss with a shitty sibling you make peace first then go ahead and judge everyone else who's yeah. bombing each other and if you do that, you will experience, you will be an agent for peace in your world. And that's the only peace you will ever experience. And that takes a lot of work. I don't want to be friends with the people that piss me off. If I want peace, I need to work on them. That's my honest answer. And it's not popular. I've been, I mean, I'm sort of Instagram famous now. And people have said shit to me that isn't kind because I have like how come you're not talking about this it's yeah. unjust and they want me to be a microphone for their shitty yeah. states of mind and their state of mind if it's to harm anyone i'm not promoting it i don't care if they think someone deserves to be killed i don't think so yes. if someone deserves yeah. to be turned i don't think so and, and it's controversial it's annoying for some people yeah. but mostly it's the people that have ugly babies yeah it's so interesting <clears throat> you know whether you like it or not or your listeners are like this person or not, or my listeners or your, your followers. What you just said is almost exactly word for word what Tucker Carlson said in an address to the Australian media. 
two days ago. Oh, wow. He was like, stop asking me to buy into this narrative. Po- th- this bipolar narrative. Yeah. The only thing I believe is that if you want to judge others, first start f- fix the things in our own backyard. That's all I'm saying. That's what he said. And I'm just like, oh, exactly what you what you said. And it is such an unpopular opinion. Because yeah, it's not. It's not- it's not popular. But unless I know how to make peace, what am I expecting? That the world is going to make peace for me? And if my mind is not in peace, make peace. Make peace with the people that you're angry at in your head. Stop thinking that you wish harm on others. And you watch the world change. It will take a long time, but it will change for you. Yeah, I believe in that power of a collective. And I just think things could, might not take a long time to change, rather. Um, if we were doing it, you know, as 50 pencils grouped together. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. But it will never happen if someone doesn't stand up and make their own change first. Yeah. Then I'm an agent for change in the world. If I'm at peace and I try as best as I can to not create conflict in my world, and then someone copies me and someone copies them and someone copies them, why are these people happy? After a while, they'll figure out, oh, they're peaceful people. Then I'll be peaceful and then more peaceful people make more. And then there's a tipping effect at some point. Hopefully it'll land on all the warring people. Yeah, I think, you know, I just, I kind of had this visual analogy just pop up into my head as to why that might be an unpopular opinion. It's like, let's just pretend we're walking through a crowd and someone that we're standing next to goes, hey, look at all those ugly people over there, for example. Like, not that that would ever happen. Maybe it would. And we grab a mirror and plant it in front of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that feels hurtful. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what you're doing. When, no, when, it is. When you say things like that, I think the mistake that others might make is that they think that you're doing that out of a disregard to the thing that they are trying to point out <clears throat> and in almost a spiteful way towards them. But yeah, how can how, planting that mirror in front of that person is more just saying, hey, listen, if you look hard enough, you'll be able to find the same flaws in yourself. Not only that, let's say that I listened to them and say, okay, Hector, speak out about this thing, right? The people sending the bombs are going to listen to Hector now and then they'll stop. That's not going to happen. But all I did is incite more violence in the mind of people to be divided mm. and to hate a group because I said so. I'm not doing that. Mm. I don't care who asks me. You know, Mm. I am going to ask everyone to stop being violent. And and I don't have agency over a territory or, you know, all suffering should be stopped. All hurting should be stopped. And if your mind is hurting, stop it. Stop your reaction to the hurt in such a hurtful way that would make you hurt others. That's where you can start. If you have power to influence governments and the rest, do it peacefully because harming people isn't going to stop harming people. Harming people harms people. That's why war is never the answer. I think that if I throw rockets over that side, then they'll stop. No, they'll send rockets back and that will make you send rockets back. And if we run out of rockets, it'll be rocks. And if we run out of rocks, it will be something else. That's never, ever, the way to peace is never war. The way to happiness is never hate. So stop hating. That's something you can actually do. Everything else is bullshit. You just want someone to blame for the pain you're experiencing in your mind. Stop your pain. That's so difficult, though. I I know I'm saying it in a simplistic way. That's why it's called a practice. What do we do with all the dead people in, in, in between and all the suffering people in the meantime? You know, well, you do your very best within your capacity. That's all you can do. And that's the best you can do. But to add hate and anger and division to an already divided, angry, hateful world isn't helping. Me screaming on social media how this side is terrible, or that side is terrible, isn't helping. But what I'm doing, I believe is helping. Change your mind and you watch your, your world change and then help someone else change their world. It's slow, but it's permanent. Yeah, and, and like I said, if we start doing it more as a collective, it's, it becomes, I think, it, the speed of it multiplies. That's what I yeah, actually yeah. think. You know, I'm, I'm mindful that you probably have a life to get back to. And, and, yeah, I do, I do. I just rushed to, to do this. I guess, uh, no, I, I love our conversations. We take them to all corners, I think. A little bit of um, subtle debauchery here or there, followed by <laughs> some laughs and some real good, deep and meaningful stuff. And I know your audience uh, enjoyed the episode that we originally did, and I hope that they get value out of this one as well, as did mine. Of course, you know, before closing out every episode, I wanted to I always ask my guests, if the, is there something that's important to you that we haven't covered or... Is there a message that's been coming up that you've been saying again and again recently to people that you want to sort of amplify 
to the people that are listening to this and, and don't have access or as as ac- much access to you as, as your current listeners do? Yeah, I, I thank you for asking. And, and it's been a theme for every retreat we've done. It's been a theme for the Med Gala and all the classes we have. And for me, it's like for people to actually return to hope. As strong as negativity arises in our minds or in the way we look at things, you got to start dreaming again like you did when you were younger, when you were a child. And there is hope to be had because the answer is always bigger than the problem. And it starts with us. And if you can find a space in your mind where you could just imagine that there is an answer to all the turmoil in our mind about the world, in our mind about our reality, in our experience, if there is an answer, the answer will always necessarily shut down the problem completely and so the invitation is try all the practices you need to but don't give up hope trying until something works because there is hope to be had and there are happy people in the world and there are good states of mind in the world even if a portion of the world is suffering you can add to the suffering or you can have hope and invite people to come on this side of hope obi-wan kenobi yeah beautiful you know i'm gonna fall into a trap here but uh you know it's for a po- for a positive reason to say that you have made me very happy today as well with uh, <laughs> making this yeah, happen my job. <laughs> yeah for making this happen for coming back and um you know I, I think there's so much value in your message and uh, for me it's really important to keep connecting you know with the, with people that really resonate with my audience and, and you're certainly one of those thank you louis it's such a pleasure yeah there's so much balance and purity in your message so um yeah it's been a an, another memorable conversation and yeah i want to thank you and three jewels for giving me the time and our audience the time and yeah i can't wait till the next time we chat same same and i'll talk to you on instagram i'll probably see the episode and i'll share it absolutely we'll be sharing the episode hopefully soon hopefully soon i've got a bit of a backlog of episodes now so yeah i'll keep you posted oh that's cool yeah i know ramping up production man (laughs) quality staying high quality staying high (laughs) good (laughs) (laughs) all right hector well thanks so much and i'll speak to you great take care thank you